listening to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Daryl Seligman. Daryl graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with degrees in mathematics and physics. He is now a graduate student and Gruber Fellow at the Astronomy Department at Yale University. His primary study is theoretical and computational astrophysics, having worked on a variety of topics that are broadly related to planet formation. Most recently, he worked on the interstellar asteroid Oumuamua, and dust plasma instabilities. Daryl Seligman, welcome back to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really thrilled to be back. Now, Daryl, the mysterious object of Muamua that we've all been talking about for, well, several <laughs> years now, you have, I think, what is probably the most satisfying explanation for this thing that I've seen yet. <laughs> that seems to seems to explain everything that was seen with that object. And it turns out, you know, the universe turns out to be weirder than we expect. A hydrogen iceberg. Tell us what led you to suggesting that maybe this was a giant piece of frozen hydrogen. <laughs> right, well, you're flattering me, but thank you for saying, yeah. I, I also think this is a pretty cool interpretation for a Muamua because like you said, the hydrogen iceberg hypothesis basically explains every single mysterious thing about Oumuamua. So I guess the story starts, and we talked about this a little bit on the last show, but with this non-gravitational acceleration that was detected. So there's a 30 sigma significant non-gravitational acceleration in the trajectory of Oumuamua that's continuously pushing it away from the sun. And we showed in, I talked about this on the last show, but we showed in that last FJ letter with Greg and Constantine that the most likely source for this non-gravitational acceleration was cometary outgassing. So what happens is you have icy, so it could be any type of ice. This doesn't have to be hydrogen ice. So this happens in solar system comets. You have frozen icy volatile material that gets, when it gets close to the sun, that ice heats up and sublimates or transitions from solid ice to gas, s produces an outflow and then pushes the body away from the sun. So we basically understood that that cometary outgassing interpretation not only would explain the non-gravitational acceleration, but would explain the constant spin period that was observed. And we showed that that kind of led to a muamua rocking back and forth like a pendulum. And that also gave us a kind of dynamical constraint on how big a muamua was, which led to a size of about 100 meters. So that was very cool. But then we realized that there was, if you say that the non-gravitational acceleration was the sublimation of some type of ice, there is an additional constraint on what type of ice it could have been which is purely an energetic constraint. So all you have to do is say, the amount of sunlight that a muamua receives at any point in its orbit, that has to be the maximum amount of energy that powers the cometary jet. So the basic idea is sunlight comes, hits the surface of a muamua, that ener those energetic photons go into what's known as the latent heat of sublimation or basically breaking apart its energy you have to put into an ice to break apart bonds to allow for the phase transition to happen. And then you have to heat those now gaseous molecules up. So you can just look at the amount of energy that Oumuamua got from the sun and say, what, what type of, we, we know how much energy was imparted to the body to account for the non-gravitational acceleration. So you can just say, well, let's look at different species of volatile materials, different ices, and say, does it receive enough energy from the sun to power 
the jet. And what we realized, the constraint is amazingly strict. So almost nothing works. So if you say that this weird non-gravitational acceleration must have been from outgassing, just from a pure energetic argument, there are only three or four volatile species that could even possibly produce the non-gravitational acceleration. And by far the most likely of those is molecular hydrogen. So something like something that you see in solar system comets like H2O, so a water jet or a CO2 or a CO jet is just ne never going to work for a Muamua. It could never produce the magnitude of the non-gravitational acceleration that you saw. So we realized that a Muamua's, if it was outgassing, if it was volatile icy material that was sublimating, it must have been powered by the sublimation of molecular hydrogen. When we looked, we saw no outgassing, but there are certain things we can't see, and hydrogen of this nature is apparently one of those. Why is that? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So basically, when you look at a comet, you barely ever see the gas. So what you see, the big, beautiful cometary tails, that's coming from light reflected off of micron-sized dust particles. And, you know, there are some dim comets and comets that you don't even detect micron-sized dust particles. So the fact that Oumuamua had no tail just meant that there wasn't that much uh, dust in, or micron-sized dust in the outflow. But they looked with, so Dave Trilling looked with the Spitzer Space Telescope, which looks, it's a satellite which can look in the infrared and the near infrared. And what that would see is emission features from carbon-based molecules. So that would actually be able to pick up the gas like you ask about. And what was shocking about the Spitzer results was that there was a very significant non-detection of a Muamua with Spitzer, which meant that it did not see any CO2 or CO coming off the body. But something like H2O, you would never see in any of that. So that H2O would effectively be invisible. But molecular hydrogen is even more elusive. And that's the reason is that molecular hydrogen is just, it's just two H's and it just has no permanent dipole moment. So you're never going to see at the low temperatures, because the thing is sublimating at such cold temperatures, you never see a, emission or absorption features. So in other words, the normal emission from a hydrogen cloud at the, the watering hole, 1420, you would not even see that in radio, right? That's right. So the hydrogen is just not very excited. <laughs> exactly. And the reason that hydrogen, yeah, basically the reason that the hydrogen iceberg thing works is also the reason that microhydrogen is so hard to detect at those temperatures. Now this gives us that cold, gives us a clue to the possible origin of this object, meaning a giant molecular cloud, a star forming region. Tell us about that. Right. So this is very cool. So hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, but you almost never hear about solid hydrogen. So hydrogen is almost always thought to be in its gaseous phase. The reason for this is that molecular hydrogen at very low pressures will sublimate or turn that just go from ice to gas at around six Kelvin. Now, six Kelvin, remember, is almost absolute zero. So zero Kelvin is, you're, you're never gonna get down to zero Kelvin, but six Kelvin is extremely cold. And just to give you a reference, the cosmic microwave background is at 2.7 Kelvin. So the only place in the galaxy that is cold enough and dense enough to even maybe be able to freeze out hydrogen into the solid phase is not only the giant molecular clouds, but the coldest, densest cores of the giant molecular clouds. Now these are the these are the these pre-stellar cores, these are the cold, dense cores of the giant molecular clouds where stars eventually will form. So the idea that we propose is that a Muamua was a hydrogen iceberg that formed in a pre-stellar core in a giant molecular cloud. Because in these pre-stellar cores, hydrogen freezes out and then builds up into macroscopic 100 to 500 meter size bodies, and then the the basically the core releases these hydrogen icebergs into the galaxy. Now this is important because that would give us a probe into stellar formation, the very earliest stages of the formation of a star, correct? Yeah, so that's one of the most exciting, it's kind of one of the most exciting ramifications in my opinion of the paper. I mean, just to think that a Muamua was a hydrogen iceberg is very cool in and of itself. But to think that you had a frozen fragment of molecular hydrogen 
from a pre-stellar core. So this is, that would mean that this is the most primordial pristine material that we could ever probe in the galaxy. And so this is the material that will lead, so before a star forms and pollutes the gas in the system, these icebergs would be solid samples delivered right to us of the material that was around that then formed a solar system, but before the star formed. So that's extremely exciting. So it, 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 it seems as though that the very, very beginnings of a star starts in the very coldest place. So this great fusion object that eventually appears comes from the very coldest conditions in the universe, essentially, right? That's absolutely right. And it's, it's pretty cool because you might say, wait a minute, you're saying that these hydrogen icebergs form around, form in these pre-stellar cores in the sites of active star formation, but they also sublimate at very cold temperatures. So if you had a core that then formed a bunch of icebergs, but then formed a star, that star would probably destroy all of the icebergs. So not only would these hydrogen icebergs have to come from the, from the pre-stellar cores, they have to come from the starless cores. So these are the cores that fail to form stars that never end up forming a star. How about mass? So say we have a whole lot of these hydrogen icebergs, you know, floating around the galaxy. Does that offer a candidate for the explanation of uh, dark matter? <laughs> oh, I'm glad you went there. So let me start by just saying what the amount of mass that is implied by Oumuamua. So the very basic argument is, you know, we detected a muamua with pan stars. It was sensitive for about 10 years. You can, the fact that we saw one means that there's about one in the inner solar system at any given time. That means that there's, if you extrapolate to the galaxy, there's about 10 to the 25 or 10 to the 26 a muamua like bodies floating around the galaxy. And that translates to roughly an Earth mass of material per star. Now, when we realized that the bulk energetic argument was hinting that molecu solid molecular hydrogen was the accelerant for a muamua, I was doing some background research and I found this paper by, uh, he's now deceased, but Stephen White, who is a professor at Riverside, who talked about could baryonic solid hydrogen be the missing dark matter in the galaxy? So that's saying, could the dark matter halo, it's, which is an, a huge amount of mass, that's affecting the galactic rotation curves, could that be all due to solid hydrogen icebergs that are effectively undetectable? And it turns out that that doesn't work because you, you just don't have enough material to form that much mass, lock up that much mass in hydrogen icebergs. Just to see one Oumuamua while we were sensitive to detecting them is much easier than affecting the entire galaxy. So while the idea of solid hydrogen was proposed as a candidate for dark matter, although that doesn't work, all of Stephen White's arguments are still valid, that you could freeze out hydrogen in very cold giant molecular clouds, and it works very, very well to create enough icebergs to account for this elusive, dark population of interstellar objects. Now, the one thing that people are going to wonder about was one of the strangest aspects of a muamua was its apparent shape. Whatever that was, it was shaped very strangely. And your model with the hydrogen iceberg actually explains this. Could you go into that? Yeah, this is very cool. So while the hydrogen iceberg interpretation of a muamua, it's a very cool sounding idea. The reason I'm so convinced of it is not is not because of the interpretation of it, but because if you posit that a muamua was solid hydrogen ice, all of these mysterious properties about a muamua get explained. So we've already talked about the non-gravitational acceleration and the energetic constraints and the lack of a coma and the lack of detecting the outgassing. But one of the weirdest things about a muamua, like you said, was the shape. And specifically by the shape, the shape, I mean the aspect ratio. So. What we got from a muamua when we we're monitoring it, if you look at the brightness variations, it changed in brightness from a factor from by a factor of about 12, which impl which means that it was brightest and dimmest. The difference between the bright bright and dim reflectances off the body was a factor of 12. So that implies 
that the body was elongated and tumbling. So you're seeing head on versus edge on projections of reflected sunlight, but you need something that's uh, at least six to one in aspect ratio. And in fact, we talked about this in the last uh, show, but the best fitting shape is the six, roughly six to six to one pancake. But six to one is extremely elongated and we have never seen anything up close in the solar system that was that drastic however if you say that Oumuamua was a hydrogen iceberg then the elongation naturally occurs over the body's lifetime so the way this works let's think about Oumuamua's journey through the solar system as it first saw the sun Oumuamua was tumbling, so it's experiencing roughly even sunlight on the whole surface of the body. And what's happening is this: the solar photons are coming to the surface, heating up hydrogen and sublimating it off the surface. So you can think of what's happening as you're roughly eating away hydrogen shells off the surface. And if you, what we do in the paper is you can just say what happens to a body if you take even ellipsoidal shells off the surface. And amazingly, this process is basically exactly what, it's exactly the same process as what happens to a bar of soap. So if you think about a bar of soap that you use in the shower, you start with something that's a little bit elongated. And as you use it, what you're doing after, after some time, what you're doing is roughly taking the same amount of material off of the entire surface of the bar of soap. So what that does is it creates a much smaller body. So the, 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 the end fragment of soap is much smaller than the original one, but it's also much more elongated. And the reason for this is very simple. So if you just take, if you take the same amount of material off the long axis, and off the short axis, that is always going to be a larger percentage of the small axis. So that isotropic removal or ablation of material will naturally produce something with an extreme aspect ratio. What this implies is that if a muamua was shedding off or ablating off these hydrogen, this hydrogen off the surface roughly isotropically or roughly all over the surface as it went through the solar system, it would naturally become more elongated. So what we saw when we detected it as it was leaving the solar system was the last withered away kind of pathetic fragment of the thing that entered the solar system, which was much bigger and much more reasonably shaped. And so what we do is the paper in the paper is we do a simulation where we say, okay, start at the date of detection and run the clock backwards in time and just do the reverse process where you pack hydrogen shells back onto a muamua and you could see that the body that entered the solar system had an aspect ratio that was much more reasonable something like two or three to one and then what you can do that that also because the thing is supplementing the, it's transitioning at six kelvin so the whole body is sitting at very cold temperatures this process is also occurring throughout the thing's lifetime so as the as a muamua, so you can backtrace it from when it enters the solar system through its journey through the interstellar medium. And instead of having solar photons hit it and sublimate off hydrogen, what you do is you have the galactic cosmic rays hit the body and evaporate the hydrogen. And what that does is you can then roughly recover an age just from that. And you can see basically what happens is a muamua gets, these icebergs get ejected from the giant molecular cloud cores and they spend their entire life first getting zapped with cosmic rays and ablating hydrogen off the surface. And then if it enters the solar system, it will feel the presence of the solar photons. Now, what is the rough age range for uh, Oumuamua? Well, it's, it's interesting. So there's a couple different ways of approaching that question. So if you say just from Let's take a muamua when we saw it, backtrace it through the solar system encounter, and then backtrace it through the galaxy and just pack on hydrogen mass back onto it. What you can say is kind of roughly, how long would it take to get back to something that could have formed reasonably, reasonably like less than two to one, maybe 1 1.5 to one, 1 1.3 to one. And that's anywhere, that's roughly 10 to 100 million years. So that implies that these things are, even though that sounds like a long time, for the galaxy, that's a very short amount of time. 
So these things are very young. So a hydrogen iceberg that forms in a giant molecular cloud gore, core, after about, another way of saying that is after about 100 million years, the cosmic rays will eat all of it away. So they can't live in the galaxy for that much, for that, that, for that, for much longer than 100 million years. So that implies that this population of interstellar icebergs is very young. So we could actually say that the dinosaurs were already long dead <laughs> when the star failed to yeah. fly. Yes, it's very cool. Now, let me ask you about this. The reddening that was detected on Oumuamua, which would be consistent with something traveling through the interstellar medium, does the hydrogen, I mean, is it going to acquire that sort of reddened patina the same way that, you know, say a comet would? Yeah, so this is basically the reason we think it's hydrogen. Not, It's not just the red in it. Like I said in the beginning, there were a couple different Hydrogen isn't the only species of ice that could work. But the reason hydrogen is such an attractive accelerant is if you look in the paper, you only need 6% of the surface to be covered in hydrogen to account for the non-gravitational acceleration. Or if that's not clear, you only need a small amount of the surface to be actively sublimating hydrogen to provide enough energy to push a muamua away from the sun with the amount of acceler non-gravitational acceleration that we saw. And so the reason that's such an attractive accelerant then is it means that a muamua did not need to be a pristine hydrogen iceberg or just the surface did not need to be completely covered in hydrogen. So there could be there can easily be other stuff in the iceberg. And that if in any realistic formation scenario that probably happens. So the hydrogen probably freezes out onto dust grains and builds up a macroscopic body that has a bunch of other gunk in it. So all of the work that was done, I mean, I did some work, I think I talked about in the last one about basically you travel through the interstellar medium and you get zapped by cosmic rays and you break down into a kind of regolith material. All of that can still happen. And moreover, that stuff gets left over. So because hydrogen is a, is a, is sublimating off the surface the entire time, the whole body sits at six Kelvin. So that means that nothing else is going to be sublimating. So the reddening is easily, that could easily be there either from the frozen hydrogen or just from the stuff that the other stuff that's on the body. So that's, that's kind of one of the reasons we think hydrogen is such an, a plausible accelerant. Now, I'm going to step out in the weeds for a minute, Daryl, on you. I'm, I'm going out in the weeds. <laughs> what of metallic hydrogen? Because that's thought to possibly be metastable. Would that behave the same way as as the hydrogen iceberg? Would that, I mean, I can't imagine how you would end up with a piece of metallic hydrogen out in the interstellar medium. <laughs> but <laughs> could that be just as viable? Uh if somebody comes up with a formation scenario for that, I would like to see it. But I think I'm going to stick with the hydrogen iceberg, the ice, the icy hydrogen for now on the giant. I think, I think the solid hydrogen ice is as exotic as I want to go for this thing. I don't think it needs to be any more exotic. Yes, it, that's probably, well, the other option was, um, your paper also looked at neon and I mean, it, there's an elephant in the room there. Hydrogen is the most <laughs> abundant element in the universe and neon, not so much. So this is very likely not to be a neon iceberg, but is there any possibility that such a thing could ever form if you had some neon rich, weird, whatever, that could uh, also form this? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm glad you asked that because you have to, if you look, so in my paper, we have a table where we show the sublimation temperatures of several vol different volatile species. And hydrogen has the lowest sublimation temperature. So the cores that cool to almost the CMB temperature are able to freeze out the hydrogen. But once you've frozen out hydrogen, you have literally frozen out every other one of those species that's in there. So you could have everything else also in there. So you could have an iceberg made of, you could imagine in a giant molecular cloud core, if this process works, you could build up, you could build up icebergs of very many different exotic materials, uh, volatile materials. So absolutely. And if you could even imagine, say you get a core that doesn't cool all the way to freeze out hydrogen, maybe it freezes out everything else. So maybe there you could build a neon, a pure neon uh, body. Now let's talk about another object because Oumuamua is not the only interstellar object we have seen. We also have Borisov. And that's right. We should actually call it Bor off because it is a comet it is by all intents and purposes a comet like you would find it in the solar system it just happens to be from another star system 
So that would suggest that Oumuamua is definitely not of the same nature of, you know, your typical run-of-the-mill object. Although it could be. I mean, they could be numerous. As you say, there could be one in the solar system at any given time. But that seems to say that given Borisov is so pedestrian, that's, which I shouldn't even use that term because I can think of all kinds of things we could study with Borisov, you know. What carbon compounds are on that thing? You know, we could ask all kinds of questions, but it seems to suggest and push Umumu in the direction of being something that at least right now we would see as exotic, such as a hydrogen iceberg, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Borisov is a very interesting object, but I kind of, I like to think that, I like to think that Borisov is so interesting because it's not interesting. Besides from the fact that it's interstellar, it's, it's basically acting exactly like what you would expect for an interstellar comet. So if you look at, I mean, we had a, there's a paper we have, Michelle Bannister is the lead author of that, but if you, we had news observations of the, so what was cool about Borisov was we had both a lot of, it was, it was had a bright coma and we had a lot of time to study it. So we got these observations and we were able to detect, you said what kind of carbon material is coming off of it. We detected C2 and CN and uh, um, NH2 in the outflow. Um, but basically what we found by studying the composition of the outflowing material was that it looks exactly, it looks very similar to typical solar system comets. So that's interesting because it's telling you, if this was a planetesimal that formed around another star, that's telling you, I think what that's telling you is that planet formation, even though we don't really understand planet formation, it's probably working in a quite similar way around other stars as it worked in the solar system. But I think what's cool about Borisov is that you detect a second interstellar object just a few years after Oumuamua, and it highlights in every single way why Oumuamua was so weird. So Oumuamua, the lack of the coma, the outgassing and the non the outgassing and non-gravitational acceleration. Um, Borisov came in and it had a big bright coma and it was clearly a comet. It didn't have an elongated shape. It was just a cometary nucleus that was sublimating. And then the last thing that, what, what I think it's telling you is that you have two distinct and roughly equally numerous populations of interstellar objects. So you have the kind of typical bright interstellar comets like Borisov, which are pretty much just like solar system comets that get scattered out by extrasolar giant planets and a filled galaxy. But then you also have a population of dark hydrogen icebergs like Oumuamua. So I think Borisov is pretty cool because it, uh, it basically is highlighting that no, that population of interstellar objects that you thought, the interstellar comets definitely exists, but there's also this much weirder, elusive population of dark hydrogen icebergs that are floating around as well. I will retract my assertion that Borisov was boring because if you think <laughs> about if you think about that, it's very similar to our own solar system comets, but our solar system produced not only life, but a civilization. That's right. That's right. So one must, and comets, you know, some say they're, they are linked. Now, one last question for you. It seems to me that if we have a hydrogen iceberg cooking through the solar system, that's useful. In other words, that's some, that's, a, that's a resource. If we can catch up and, and do something with it, what could we do if, if, you know, uh, I guess it's two stage question. What could we do with it? If we could catch up with it and if we could catch up with one, how could we study it? What kind of probe could we send to look at these? Yeah, so I think I talked about this a little bit on the uh, on the last show, but in, in my first paper about a Muamua, I had I had proposed sending an interception mission to an interstellar object, and I think you're kind of referencing that because we basically said to. I mean, you could look at the different types of ways you could visit an interstellar object. Basically, because they're moving so fast, the only feasible thing to do is kind of jump in front of it, like jumping out in front of a fast moving truck and intercepting it with an impactor. But then what you could do is that would impart a lot of energy and you could kind of study up close and do a detailed study of the material that was coming off in the impact. So that would be the good thing about if, the, so 
The cool thing about the hydrogen icebergs is that because they're so elusive and hard to detect, the ones that we do detect come much closer to the Earth. So Oumuamua came much closer to the Earth than Borisov did. So that means it would actually be a lot easier to do an interception mission to an interstellar hydrogen iceberg because you're going to detect the closer ones. It would be it would be extremely interesting. So one thing to do would just be to verify what it was made of. So what you could imagine doing was having an inter having a payload that had an impactor and also scientific instruments like a mass spectrometer, which would be able to which would able be able, be able to detect the mass of the speed the things that were coming off of the impact, and that would be able to verify if it was molecular hydrogen that was producing the non that it was if it was a hydrogen iceberg. So just just figuring out what it's made of is the first order thing you want to do, and that's very interesting. But on a more broad kind of why why study these hydrogen icebergs is they basically give you the they give you a probe of the most pristine and the most primordial material that's in the galaxy. So we've done lots of missions in the solar system to look at the results of what happens after stars form. So after stars forms, you get a disk and then you get the disk goes away and you have planets and you have comets and asteroids and you can kind of you can learn a lot about how those processes work from studying the remnants of that of that uh, planet formation process. But for the first time ever, you could be able to up close probe the material that formed a star. So before the material and the gas gets polluted from the star and the planets that form around there, you could probe that pristine material because it's locked up in these hydrogen icebergs. So I think that's extremely interesting because that would tell you about the initial conditions of star formation itself. The, the life of a hydrogen atom, it could either just wander the universe aimlessly or it could end up being fused into something else in the start. It's absolutely amazing. It is amazing. All right. It is amazing. We are out of time, Daryl. Thanks for joining us again, and I look forward to your next paper. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a blast. Thanks for watching Event Horizon. Unfortunately, John's not here to do the usual joke. He's too busy trying to coax an opossum out of a truck that needs to go back by 3pm and not a minute later, or we lose the deposit. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this one. <laughs>